What is virtualization? Why is it such a critical skill to learn? For creating development and test environments? For being able to run different operating systems without having to buy new hardware? For creating a sandbox for learning and teaching? Virtualization is a very useful technology. Let's go have a look. To understand virtualization, we need to begin with the basics of computers. We need to understand how computers work at a very foundational or basic level. At a very basic level, if I buy a computer, I'm buying some hardware. So I have a bunch of hardware that comprises the computer, and that computer will have an operating system of some sort. Now, it could be a Windows operating system, which is very common, Windows 10 or Windows 11. If it's a computer that I'm going to be using for um, a business, I might have some sort of server software on there. I might have Linux on there if I'm doing some Unix work. Um, I might even have a Mac OS, but it is important to notice that with a Mac OS, I'm also going to have Apple hardware. They're very intricately linked, the Mac operating system and the Mac hardware. In this particular demo, it doesn't really matter what the operating system is here. The concepts are what we're looking at here. For the typical user though, they don't really care too much about the specifics of the hardware or the operating system. They'll make some decisions on that, of course, everybody will have an opinion. But for the most part, what users are concerned about are applications. They want to be able to run Microsoft Office, Word, or Excel. They want to be able to run an accounting package that they like. They want to be able to run an astronomy program, some educational software. That list goes on and on. There are many, many, many different applications out there, and the user wants to interact with the application. The operating system controls which applications have access to the hardware, and everybody is happy. Now, in today's world, we have some pretty powerful hardware out there that we're purchasing. So it's not uncommon to have in the Intel world an i5, an i7, an i9 processor of different generations. There are many different processors out there and they are very powerful. It's not uncommon to have a lot of storage, different types of hard drive. The main component of any computer system is going to be a motherboard that allows me to install all of the other components on it. So if I have, for example, a motherboard, what I'll do is I'll be able to install a hard drive on the motherboard. I'll be able to install a processor on the motherboard. If we take something like the processor and we take a look at, you know, the various, you know, here I was talking about the i5, the i7 and such. And there are other processors out there. For example, in the Mac world, you have some that run on Intel processors, the older ones, and newer Macs will run on an M1 chip, which is proprietary. They call it proprietary silicon. So it has, you know, the proprietary hardware with the Mac operating system. And then we'll have combined with that processor, we will have something like RAM. We'll have some sort of memory that we will use on our computer as well. Now we're getting to the virtualization in a second here, but these concepts are very important for us to understand virtualization. That's why I cover them. So the other thing that we'll have, of course, is storage, and we have different types of storage. For the most part, we'll have a hard drive that connects directly to that motherboard, but sometimes we'll have external hard drives. The point here being is that we have storage of some sort, a place to store permanent files. And that's, there's persistent storage. Here in memory, we have volatile storage. So this is disappears once the system is turned off or unpowered. Anything that I save onto an external or an internal hard drive will be persistent. And we have different flavors of hard drives, solid state drives, mechanical drives. And then we'll have as a third element here, I guess it's a fourth element, but in a moment you'll see why I consider it a third element. But we have, whoa, come back here. Come back here, my diagram. What we will have here is we will have some sort of I.O. ports and different types of I.O. ports that we could have be USB ports, could be a printer port, could be all often printers nowadays are USB. Uh, important one there would be our network. So we have our, our CPU and our memory, which we often refer to in the world of virtualization as our compute layer resources. We have our I.O., which of all of them, the network is one of the most important ones, but of course we can have other devices like USB devices as well. And then we have our storage, which is often going to be manifested as a internal hard drive. 
So those are the components of a typical happy computer system and the operating system is responsible for act, acting as an abstraction layer. So where does virtualization come into this? In today's world, we have some really powerful systems. We have extra capacity in our storage. We often have one gigabit per second uh, ethernet access. <clears throat> our compute resources are often not utilized at 100% utilization. So we don't use 100% utilization. So what can we do with all these extra non-used resource? That's where virtualization comes in. So when it comes to virtualization, we actually install a virtualization app called a hypervisor. So we talk about type one hypervisors, which is basically a dedicated operating system that is just going to be for virtualization. And then we have a type two hypervisor, which is really desktop virtualization, and it coexists with the existing operating system and the existing applications. So in the world of Windows, what we can do is we can install an application. An example of such an application would be something like VMware Workstation. So we could install VMware Workstation. In the world of Windows, we could install something called Hyper-V. Now Hyper-V comes in two parts. Part one is we have the management tool that we can use to manage a Hyper-V environment. And then we actually have the platform itself. And I have a subsequent video to this one that'll show you how to do that. So we have a tool that manages the platform. This means that in a data center, I could have multiple, oh, didn't want that. I could have multiple blade servers, for example. I could install the platform on all of these servers. And then what I could do is have the management tool installed separately and then use it to manage my entire infrastructure. We're not going to cover that here in this video. That's more data center virtualization. We're gonna look more at the desktop virtualization, but by installing both of those components here, we can create our own virtual environment. Well, what, what is that virtual environment? What, what does that mean? Well, it means that this operating system with its extra capacity can act as a host to a guest or even multiple guests. And what we can do is we can install a guest virtual operating system. It's a real operating system, but what we do is we provide that operating system with virtual hardware. So we give it hardware so it thinks that it has storage that's dedicated to it. It thinks it has a network dedicated to it. It thinks it has compute resources, RAM and processor dedicated to it. So any operating system that I install on the virtual machine doesn't know or realize that it's a virtual environment. It thinks it's its own computer. And then what I can do is I can install applications onto that virtual machine. So as an example, this host operating system could be something like Windows 11. And then this guest operating system could be something like Linux. And then what I'm going to be able to do is any of these applications are Windows applications and any of these applications are Linux applications. I boot up my one system, my hardware, my system. I launch my virtualization software, my virtualization application, and I can run that operating system in this environment. And this becomes quite useful because what I'm able to do now, I'll just clean up and move over a little bit here. What I could do is I could take that nice host operating system with all of its power and all of its extra resources. I could install that special hypervisor software, the virtualization software. I'm just going to use Hyper-V as an example. And then I could actually install multiple guest operating systems. So I could install a Windows 10 machine. I could install a Linux machine. And those machines will actually have a virtual network between them if I like. So they can have a virtual network between them. And I have a whole sandbox environment where I can play with them. Now, here I will have my base guest or my host operating system hardware. So if I have something like 16 gigabytes of RAM, and if I have an i9 processor, and if I have storage available, let's say I have a one terabyte drive 
of which I'm able to get dedicate 250 gigabytes to virtual machines. And I have my network adapter running at one gigabit per second. I'm sharing these resources. So this Windows 10 machine would not be able to have 16 gigs of RAM. It, let's say I give this machine eight gigs of virtual RAM and I give it, you know, time on the processor that'll be managed by the virtualization hyper, hypervisor layer. And I give it, let's say 100 gigabytes of storage. That 100 gigabytes will be persistent. So it'll be taken out of my host system and my Linux machine, I'm going to give it four gigabytes of RAM and I'm going to, it's still going to use part of the i9 processor and I'm going to give it 50 gigs of storage. So now I've taken out a little bit more storage of this permanent storage as well. Now, when I turn off the machine, I will no longer be using any RAM or any processor, but just like regular storage, my storage will be persistent. So I will have used 150 gigs, 50 here, 100 here. When the machines are turned off, I will actually still have that storage on the host system. Now we will talk in some ups, upcoming videos, we'll talk about how we can make this dynamic allocation. So I can say you can go up to 100 gigs, but only use as much as you need. So maybe when I install the operating system and everything, it only requires 20 gigs of storage for all the, for the operating system and the apps that I decide to install. But as I install more, that will grow. And I will say I cap it out at 100 gigs. So if I only use 20 gigs, only 20 gigs of my host system will be used and it can grow to 100 gigs. So you can kind of overcommit your storage, but then you have to monitor it and make sure. We'll talk about that later. But the concept behind virtualization is that I have a host machine. I have this host machine here with, a, with all these hardware resources and I share them as virtual hardware resources that another operating system will allow me to use. And that's virtualization. If you want to see how this is done, check out the next video where I'm going to show you how to use Hyper-V. We'll install Hyper-V on a Windows 11 machine, set up a development environment and actually run Windows 11 on top of Windows 11 in this case. So that's the foundation of what virtualization is. The next step, of course, is going to be to install the virtualization software so that we can begin creating virtual machines. In the next video, I will show you exactly how to do that. This video is part of a course that I have on Skillshare. I put a link down below if you're interested in checking out Skillshare. Uh, they're not sponsoring this video, but I do have courses over there. Check them out, links down below. And also if you like this video, hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already and share with colleagues because that really helps out the channel. Thank you so much for watching.